Coming up, the evil twin is back. Holy schnitzel. I offer a man a stick. Do you need a stick? I bring a stick. A Maserati with over 300,000 kilometers. That's just insane. It must be good, right? Ooh, that's slow. This isn't a BMW. Holy schnitzel. What are you doing? This isn't a BMW. I know. I literally just said that. So you're finally losing it. It's a broken Maserati. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Why didn't you say so? I'm sure they are reliable and cheap to fix. You dipstick. See you in another two years. What's with the negativity? I mean, can't be that bad, can it? Says a man who doesn't know anything about Maseratis. As if messing with over-engineered German hunks of metal wasn't enough. Now you gotta dabble with Italians? That boy be crazy. That being said, it is intriguing. Hmm, Chrysler. What do we have? Well, that can't be right, can it? 301,935 kilometers. Okay, don't panic. Just don't touch anything and run away. I've been meaning to branch out, broaden my horizons, if you will, with another brand for quite some time. Maserati Quattro Porte has been on my I wanna buy that broken list. But not this one, rather the previous generation with the glorious, naturally aspirated 4.7 liter V8 engine. While searching for one, I came across this auction listing. The current M156 Quattroporte model. The title says, as you can see, 3 liter S model with the V6, which meant I wasn't interested. But upon looking at the pictures closer, I realized this is not a common model with the measly V6, but the top trim Quattroporte GTS with the Ferrari based 3.8 liter twin turbo V8 engine pumping out 530 horsepower and 650 newton meters of torque. One can differentiate models by looking at the exhaust tips. The lower trim models have four round exhaust tips, while only the GTS has square-ish tips, and the dead giveaway is the V8 badge and the cover in the engine bay. This is actually a rare and expensive car that was advertised incorrectly as a much more common and less expensive model. I got excited, and then I heard how the GTS actually sounds. <laughs> And got even more excited. How did they make a turbocharged car sound so damn good was my immediate reaction. I couldn't find the exact sales numbers for the GTS, but they haven't made that many of them. They are fairly rare and the cheapest one I could find in Europe at the time was listed for 36,000 euros. This one was listed at buy now for 18,500 euros. Mind you, it did have over 300,000 kilometers and interestingly enough, there was no description and under damage, it only listed scratched alloy rims, nothing else. Only by looking at this picture, I could see that the check engine and airbag lights were on. Screaming deal as this was, it was so cheap, I decided to gamble and went for that buy now button. My Maserati just arrived. Does it actually work and start? It's blue. Oof, winter tires. Ooh, the brakes are shot. Oh, that is some thick lip, my man. Confirmed, it has an engine. I think it was resprayed. The bumper for sure. I think the hood is bent now. Do you need a stick? I bring a stick. Okay, wait. <laughs> I think the transport guy doesn't like the car. Off to a great start. No? Okay, let's try mine. Okay, go. No? Doesn't even want to click. It's already dead. <laughs> the guy's swearing in Polish inside. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Vallejo headlights. It doesn't even want to click. No? Can I try? Okay, let me try. I think what he's trying to say, this is my problem now. Look at me and my Maserati. Say you stupid thing. Beeping me in Italian. 
It says run. It just needed the magic touch. It actually works. That is unbelievable. And it's not smoking. Did I buy a working GTS? <laughs> Bellissimo. Oh, no, <laughs> okay, he says it's shrot. <laughs> He's insulting my Maserati. Okay, we need to find where's the catch. Why was this car cheap? I think it's misfiring. Doesn't sound happy. No sunroof. Hell yeah. You know what? The paint looks good on the first glance. All right, first drive in Quattro Porte. Oh, it has pitiless doors. That is so cool. Oh, it's in miles now. 187,000 miles and a flash and check engine light. That's always good. Usually a flash and check engine light is a really bad thing and you shouldn't be driving this car. So I just want to get it inside and turn it off. Why does that stupid mirror keep going down? Don't go down. It sounds like a jet. The fans are running constantly on. Can you believe it? A piece of Italian cheese in my yard. How cool is this door, huh? I gotta go sign some papers with the truck guy. Be back in a sec. It looks quite good, doesn't it? It's really filthy, I need to wash it, but the paint looks actually decent. The front bumper was resprayed, I believe, but everything else appears to be more or less good. Quite a big scratch in the hood over there. The tires are in awful condition, winter tires, spectacularly curved rims, and I have never ever seen in my life such worn brake rotors, like the lip is just massive. And then, what do you think of my Chrysler, huh? Quality right there. Pretty darn filthy inside. Steering wheel needs a good clean. Maybe it'll come back around. Beige and blue leather interior. Is this a leather dash? I like that. And Alcantara or suede headliner. This is a nice car. It's really big. It's really massive. We have free water in the back. That must be for the, for the radiator. So that's good. Oh, 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 let's see. Resprayed? Yes, sir definitely resprayed and this is how you can tell the difference between a standard quattro porte and the gts it's the exhaust steps it's sort of that quad look as you can see Ooh, this was someone's wedding car that's the dead battery toolkit no toolkit all right this side is you know same as the other one So we established that the hood shocks are good. This is the Ferrari F154 3.8 liter twin turbocharged V8 engine. The same one you can find in Ferrari California, GTC4, Roma, Tributo, whatever. Except it's not. In the Ferrari it has a dry sump and a flat plane crankshaft. In the Maserati it has a cross plane crankshaft and wet sump. So it sounds quite a lot different. And now we need to see if we can figure out what's wrong with this thing. Guess we can start with basics. That is an oil cap, confirmed. Hmm. Quite a small entrance into the engine. Power steering, yeah, that's good. It has two coolant reservoirs. I believe the turbochargers are water-cooled. Oh, let's start it again. This is the key. It's really hefty. That is the start button. Accessories, run. How do you do this? How do I switch you to English? Display, lingua. No, metrish, English. There you go. 301,000 kilometers. That's, that's just insane. Okay, let's try this again. No, my battery tender is, is dead. Let's replace the battery. Well, how do I keep it up? I guess like that. Okay, we're gonna replace the battery. Does this unplug? Plugs there, I guess. Is it strapped? It's not. Oh, it is. It has an actual strap holding the battery. How about now? There we go. Oh, here's a good battery. It's the strap. Oh, oh, careful. Ouch. 
strap you in, huh? I would draw this car before. It's a, it's a very small chap because the seat is like in the highest position. A bit rattly and definitely not happy. Oh my God, does it sound good. There's the check engine light. It barely has any fuel and the fan is constantly running to the point where I actually can't hear the engine. You see that it's shaking a little bit. But you know what? It's not smoking. Should be a good sign. Turbos might be good, but definitely misfiring. It was flashing before, now it's just there. And the airbag light, and I think that's for the tires or something. All right, let's plug in the diagnostic tool. I bought an Autel specifically for this car. Hopefully we can read the codes. And I thought BMW bongs were annoying. Shut up! How do you turn this thing on? Ooh, these are very nice. These are metal, man. Oh, we have soft touch plastic as well. Nice. Maserati, there we go. Okay, which one do we have? M156, 2013. Auto scan, 12 faults in the engine, engine computer. Three faults in the transmission. So many faults. Okay, the glare on the screen is just nuts. I don't think I can show you anything here. So let's see. Power steering, oil temperature, sensor, circuit high. Lost communication with brake system. Bank two, camshaft, position slow response. Bank two, camshaft, position timing over advance or system performance. Multiple cylinder misfire. So I think the two that are interesting are bank our bank to camshaft position slow response and bank to camshaft position time over advanced or system performance. Well, for now, we are going to clear all of the codes and see what comes back. Codes have been successfully erased. Just the power steering oil temperature sensor circuit too high. So it must be a connector or the sensor is faulty. Uh, transmission has three faults. I believe this is the eight speed ZF transmission. Uh, implausible driver shift request, implausible blah blah blah. I think these are all related to the battery being dead. So we're gonna clear those as well. Five codes in the airbag. So the active code is driver frontal squib one control wires shortened together. So that's our airbag light. Let's just do a quick raise and everything because the battery was dead. All right, let's see what it says now. Yeah, it's misfiring again. The whole car is shaking. Three codes are immediately back. Power steering, oil temperature sensor, circuit high, and crankshaft, camshaft timing, misalignment. Bank two, sensor one. And then we also have a new one. Fuel pressure regulator two, exceeded control limits, pressure too high. But I mean, it sounds good. I think the first thing we're gonna do now is wash it see the condition of the paint properly. Because after all, that is the most important thing, isn't it? I'm gonna get the Evil Twin to wash the car. I can't be bothered, I'm too lazy. The steering wheel is so disgustingly dirty, I can't even touch it, so we need to clean it. Okay, that's much nicer and cleaner. It's not in perfect condition, but it's much better than what it was. And you know, not too bad, it feels good. It cleaned up nicely. I don't know the exact name of the color, maybe passion blue, but it looks great. It's nice deep blue metallic. I believe it was resprayed. I know that the front bumper was definitely resprayed. The rear quarter panel, not sure about the rest, but I mean, it's not awful. It needs a good detail job, paint correction, all that stuff, and it's gonna look great. Inside, I take it back. The steering wheel is in horrible condition because it was re-dyed. So all of this is dye on the stitching as well, and it's actually coming off. Now when I clean the steering wheel, the dye is coming off, so we'll need new leather on the steering wheel. But the seat, pretty much nowhere. Just needs a good detail in here as well. Maybe a new rubber for the brake pedal. Oh, definitely for the, for the throttle. Pedal. Yeah. Oh, that's plastic and that's worn. You can see stuff like that. There's some nastiness right over there. But here you can see some nastiness in the center console. It's all a bit icky. But look how cool that clock is, huh? Soft touch plastic on the steering wheel. The back seat's in great condition and it's really comfortable in here and the rear seats are heated as well. What do you think of the design? It's actually a lot bigger in person than it is in pictures. I think I would compare this to the 7 Series. If I'm right, it's, it's really big, but I like the design. 
I really do. I think I like the previous generation better, but this is still a good looking car. The exhaust tips look great. Small scuff on the bumper over there. A few scratches in the trunk lid, but as I said, needs a nice paint correction and it's gonna look great. Let's take a look in the glove box. Ooh, nice pouch. Maserati. Sold brand new in Italy. I don't think this car ever left Italy. Is there like a service book or something? There we go, this is the service book. It starts 2013 at 20,000 kilometers. First oil change, that's horrible. 40,000, 41,000 kilometers second oil change. Again, horrible. 61, 85, 102, 121, 141, 162, 184, 205. Look at that, it has complete service history. 228, 250, and 272 last. So it probably didn't have an oil change since 2019. Revisione completa motore. Really? That means revision of the complete engine. Oh no. Looks like they revised the entire engine on this car. Oh, there's another one. 2020, 293,000 kilometers. Maybe, what does it say over there? I think Ineco, maybe I can get in touch with them and see what they've done to the car. So I'm not sure if this means revision of the complete engine as in complete rebuild or just a thorough service. So I might get in touch with this company and ask if they are willing to share what they've done to the car exactly. But yeah, we have complete service history in all of the manuals. Okay, I just googled and revisione completa motore means complete engine overhaul. And it looks like that was done at 272,000 kilometers. Looks like the engine was out for a complete rebuild. But I don't really like that. Okay, the good news is Maserati is broken and it's serious, but it looks great. I love the color combo, blue and white letter with blue dash. Works great. I think this car is gonna be worth saving, but let's see. The next step is to pull it inside, start troubleshooting, have a look underneath. Don't you beep at me. Oh, the shifter is so stupid. Oh, the turning circle is amazing. The exhaust sounds so good, yet the engine's so terrible. Off. It won't turn off. Off. Thank you. Let's check the suspension. This wheel is fine. Uh, is this the Sky Active fancy dampers? I'm sure they're cheap as well. How about here? No play in this wheel, that's nice. Rear brakes are even worse. Like this is unbelievable how big the lip is. Look at the condition of the rear rotors. That lip is massive. Okay, this wheel is good as well. The ball joint looks good. I mean, overall, it looks really clean. On the first glance, no obvious suspension issues. Okay, Snoop Dogg, what do we have? Let's start Tour d'Italia in the back. Look how tiny the mufflers are. I like that. Must be why they sound so good. No rust so far. A bit of surface rust on the bolts, but not terrible. The rear suspension. Visually, nothing looks out of place here. The diff is pretty grimy. It doesn't look like we have an active leak though. The ball joints and the bushings, visually all good. ZF made in Germany. Maserati, the shocks. That's damaged. Should look something like that. So it looks like someone went off-roading because this panel here is damaged as well, scraped. And that's, that's bent. The transmission, eight speed. There we are, oil leaks. Could be the rear main seal, could be a lot of things. So let's put that back in for now. The engine, I can see wetness on the oil pan there as well. Well, I guess we gotta take this panel off and look around the engine. I guess not terrible for 300,000 kilometers. I think that was the last one. Nope. We have clips here. 
three clips on the sides. Well, can't see much here. We need to remove this one as well. Screws. Well, hello there, Olix. Coming from BMW, this is completely unusual for me. I mean, typically you never see that on the ultimate machine. A chocolate bar thingy. Mother Do you know what this is? This was on my desk over there. It was a chocolate bar that disappeared. That the little mouse took, he took the entire thing and he brought it to the Maserati. Look, it's been eaten. I hope he didn't chew on any wires here. But it looks like he liked the Maserati and he came here. That's astonishing, man. And he ate the whole thing as well. I mean, the chocolate bar is bigger than the mouse. It looks that the Scarico Olio, aka the drain plug, is leaking. Hence the wetness all around. Other than that, I can't see anything, anything major. A lot other than this, but whatever. The belt looks okay. So nothing terribly wrong underneath of the car. We need a service position. Here's the L stick. Oh, well, we can't have a service position because this is the maximum the hood will open. It won't go past this point. So that's great. It's at least it's a little bit higher. So we have a code that the timing on bank two is incorrect. It could be that the camshaft position sensor is bad and it's giving false readings. Unlikely, but I would like to eliminate that possibility. So we're simply going to swap around the sensors. Bank one sensor goes on bank two. Then we're gonna clear the codes, start the car. And if the code stays on the same bank, we know that the sensors are good. And our problem is indeed the timing of the engine. So on a BMW, bank one is the passenger side and bank two is the driver's side. On a Maserati, no clue, but it could be the same. Okay, let's get this beauty cover off. Was it just? Pop off. Sure. Oh, it's, it's heavy, man. It's a lot of sound deadening there. So I actually looked on the diagram and I couldn't find camshaft position sensors. They must be called differently in Maserati world, but that could be the sensor. There's a zip tie here. So that's all dandy. Is that where the filter goes? That's, that's cute. I mean, it's a clean engine overall. Each bank has two camshaft position sensors. This is the first one and that's the second one. The connector here is held with a zip tie, which is reassuring, but it does look like it's plugged in properly. So I think for the start, I'm just gonna swap around these two because the code currently says sensor one. So if it says sensor two, then we know one of these sensors is bad. So the clip here is broken, but the connector otherwise looks fine. Great. How did that? Oh no, it's completely stuck in there. Okay, I successfully retrieved my tools. So the sensor is made by Bosch. What kind of connector is this? What the f <clears throat> It seems I can't work the connector off. What kind of Mickey Mouse stuff is this? <clears throat> there it is. That's the second one removed. So this one we're gonna pop in here. And the other one down there. Okay, I can't remember if I checked the oil level, but I just spotted the oil dipstick. The oil is really black. So I would say it's due for an oil change. No refill. What? Mm, the oil level heavily overfilled. What? It's like way, way above max. Well, that's no good. It does smell oily. It doesn't look like there's fuel or coolant in there but it's definitely overfilled. So I think we'll need to remove some oil. But anyway, let's for now clear the codes, start it and see if there's any change. Still works like garbage. Read codes. Yep. Sensor one is still there. So bank two, sensor one. Let me just unplug one of them and see what happens then just to confirm that we're looking at the right sensor. Okay. Yeah, we are looking at the right one for sure. I just unplugged it and it says, well, it's giving a different code when I unplug the top one. So I'm unplug the bottom one. 
Okay, by unplugging the sensors, I confirmed that the one with the zip tie is the bank two sensor one, the one where it's showing that the engine is out of time. By swapping around the sensors, we confirm that the issue is not the cam position sensor. And by unplugging the sensor here, I confirm that this is bank two sensor one. So this is the camshaft here that's out of time. I just spent some quality time with the repair manual, which is a PDF file with over 5,000 pages. It is a complete mess and I couldn't find the exact procedure how to check the timing of this engine. I did find that there are some covers on the top of the valve covers that you can remove and then pop in the pins to lock the cams and I guess check the timing that way. But before we do that, it's pretty certain that the engine skipped timing. And as this is an interference engine, it is possible that the pistons smack the valves, in which case we are going to need at least a partial rebuild, if not the full rebuild of this engine. So the best way to determine that is to perform a compression test and a leak down test. So now we're going to remove the ignition coils and all the spark plugs, pull out the fuel pump fuse and first do a compression test and then a leak down test. And if it fails, this engine needs to come out and be rebuilt. Great news for my wallet. All right, I wanna blow out the dust. That'll do it. Okay, unplug the ignition coils so I can figure out how to work these weird connectors. Oh, there it is. Ignition coil, who makes this? Eldor. Eldor makes ignition coils for BMW as well. So this should be the parts to include reservoir. I wonder where the sensor is. Let's blow out the spark plug holes. Well, the spark plug tool doesn't appear to fit. Had to borrow a 14 mil spark plug socket from my neighbor. I only have 16. There we go. That wasn't very tight. There's the spark plug. It looks terrible. It's really, really black. Equally as bad. And that's all of the spark plugs removed. This looks like a fuse box. There it is. I need either a fuel pump relay or a fuel pump fuse. Aha, uh -huh. it's an Italian, but pompa alimentation. No, that's not it. Ah, this could be it. Primario pompa carburante destra. According to the owner's manual, we have a primary and secondary fuel pump, and it is a fuse 49 and 53 in this box here. Okay, okay. With that, the fuel pumps are disabled, so you can't pump fuel in the cylinders and wash out the cylinders, very important. Here's the compression tester. First, you're gonna start with bank one, cylinder one. Now we're gonna do six to eight cranks per cylinder and get the compression reading. It should be above 10 bars, 150 PSI. If it's below that, then the engine is not healthy. But before anything, it needs to be consistent. Also, we're doing a compression test on a cold engine, which is not ideal, but I can't exactly warm it up when it runs like crap. The battery's on the tender. Why won't you crank? What do you want from me? Okay, it's a car. I can't even turn it off. I can't, I can't do anything. It won't let me turn the ignition off. Okay, with the fuel pump fuses removed, the car won't crank actually goes completely berserk and it won't let me turn the ignition off at all. So I lifted up the rear seat and unplugged the pumps on both sides. Let's see if it will crank now. What do we have? Ooh, that's low. That is pretty low, 100 PSI or seven bar. Not good. Let's do it one more time. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven bar. Let's move on to the next one. Cylinder number two, seven bar. Three, 7.5. And now the problematic side. 12, 12 bar. These are the results and here's where my lack of experience with turbocharged engines and these Ferrari, Maserati, Alfa engines in particular kicked in. My immediate reaction was that bank one was bad as it was showing way too low compression numbers and that bank two was good. But here's the twist, it's the other way around. 
This is a low compression turbocharged engine. It's not supposed to show high compression numbers when tested cold. After later doing some research, I found documentation for the Alfa Romeo 2.9 V6 engine, which is the same engine as this one, minus two cylinders, and it states the compression shouldn't be less than 100 PSI and not very more than 25% from cylinder to cylinder. This is a clear indication that we have a problem with bank two, while at the time I thought it was the other way around. The more you know. Based on the compression test results, I think we probably got lucky and that the valves are not bent. If the piston slapped the valves, we wouldn't get such consistent results per bank. We would either get no compression at all, or they were just spiking all over the place. But the fact that it's somewhat even per bank is good. So once the engine is back in time, we can perform a leak down test that will tell us if the cylinder heads are good and the valves are sealing and the condition of the piston rings as well. But the biggest question that we need to ask right now is why did the engine jump timing in the first place? Because we can retime the engine, put it back together, and then it happens again down the road in 100 kilometers. So we need an answer to that question and the root cause. Could be a couple of things. Uh, could be related to oil pressure. If you remember Project Chicago Alpina B7, the oil pressure switch failed with the previous owner. The engine lost oil pressure and all of the timing chain tensioners, they need oil pressure to tension the chain. But when there's no pressure, it'll allow for slack to happen in the chain and it can skip timing. So maybe that's what happened here. Maybe the oil pump is bad. Maybe the timing chain tensioners slash guides failed something like that. In any case, before we do anything else, I want to remove the oil pressure switch, connect the gauge and monitor the engine oil pressure. If the engine oil pressure is low, then we know that this engine has some major internal issues and it's going to need a complete teardown and rebuild. But anyway, the timing chains, they live on the back of the engine because remember this engine was developed for Ferrari 488 where it lives in the back of the car so it's easy to access it over there. Here not so much, at the very minimum you need to unbolt the transmission but I think it's just better to drop the whole thing because I don't think it's just gonna end with the timing chains. We're probably gonna find some other stuff. So let's check the oil pressure first and then take it from there. There you can see the oil pressure switch on the back of the oil filter housing. I'm gonna remove the switch. Why are the connectors so weird on this car? Why does it have extra clips? I don't get it. Let's remove this. Yes, there it is, it's unplugged. Is it like 27 or something? It is. Okay, so they don't use a crush washer here, but like thread sealant. This is the oil pressure test kit. Just need to find the right size here. It's gonna be this one. Uh, I can connect the gauge. All right. And there it is. We can get a reading here. Before we start the car again, I want to remove the excess oil. This goes where the oil dipstick goes. Gonna check the level now. Okay, now we are slightly below max. So the engine was overfilled by about half a liter. I couldn't find the exact oil pressure specification for this particular engine but the oil pressure should be pretty high with the engine cold because the oil is really thick. And then as it warms up, it's gonna drop down. So I'm gonna start it and then run out really quickly and just make sure that my connection is not leaking. And if all is good, then I'm just gonna let it warm up and take the reading. That is 60 PSI, 70. Let me make sure it's not leaking. 70 psi that's good but now it needs to warm up and then see what the oil pressure is then the car is now warm and you can see the oil pressure it's 2.5 bar which is about 35 psi and when i give it throttle the oil pressure goes up as it should man it sounds so good we definitely need to fix this car so i'm gonna go ahead and say that we don't have oil pressure issues Okay, and with that, let's remove this engine. I could potentially just remove the transmission and then we can access the timing chains from the back. But I think overall, it's just gonna be better if we drop the entire thing down with the subframe, unbolt the transmission, and then I have easy access to everything. And if you have further issues like bent valves or whatever, we can, uh, we can take it further. 
okay, I've never worked on a Maserati before and here I am about to drop the engine. <laughs> life is good, life is good. Stay frosty for the next episode where we remove the drivetrain and further troubleshoot this complex engine and find out if it's fixable or not. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.